What was the weirdest black market in your school? We did a weird assignment for a month where we ran a society for an hour each day in our classroom. People had little shops they ran from their desks, there were elected positions, laws you could be ticketed for breaking, etc. It was all run on fake money, of course. I got elected chief of police and handed out tickets for stuff like chewing gum in class. But a combination of laziness and not wanting everyone to hate me caused me to slack off, and I got fired after two weeks. So I opened a shop instead and sold some stuff, including gum, which in hindsight makes me like a cop who became a drug dealer. The final week of this rolls around and there's an announcement. At the end, all of your money will be tallied up, any debts or taxes you owe subtracted, and any kid who wound up with a positive amount gets a pizza party. Kids who are in the red have to write an assignment on how and why they screwed up. This electrifies the class. Missing out on a pizza party is a big damn deal when you're 10, and well under half the class is currently in the black. Tons of them had taken out huge loans in the beginning to set up businesses and had no way to repay them. Not me though, I had been receiving a salary as a cop. And after being fired, I just used the money I had accumulated to set up shop and had no debts. Few in the class could say that, so I was sitting pretty. Soon I started receiving offers of real money on the playground for some of my fake money. You only needed to be $1 over zero to win, so I could spare plenty. Made $40 in actual cash. I think I charged $5 for 100 fake dollars and got 8 people to accept. So I was a corrupt cop who became a drug dealer who became a money launderer. And won. So I definitely learned a lot about how society works. Part of me wonders if the teacher knew about this. Because I guarantee there are cynical enough teachers out there that would be like, yeah, you know what, fair play. It's how the world works. Seriously though, gotta be honest, it's a little bit of a weird assignment. I feel like something like this could cause a lot more problems than uh, help, you know? Hey guys, we have a new channel where we go over very in-depth stories. Whether it's a Karen on the loose or a story about a mother's perspective on her husband throwing out their daughter's ashes. The link will be in the description. Make sure to subscribe to the new channel. Story 2. In early elementary school, we had a market for mud. Different groups of kids would claim areas around the school as their mud pit and put their brand of mud in Ziploc bags to be traded with other groups for different bags of mud. We were the clay mud group, and I had about three kids in the muck scooping it into bags or running to the water fountain to get fresh water to make more mud on dry days. I would be the one to go make the deals with the other groups. We traded a lot with the gravel mud group, because clay mud and cement mud are both good for building or something, who knows. It made so much sense at the time. The principal and staff eventually stepped in to end it, because all the kids came back to class filthy every day and giant holes littered every field and playground. The children. The children yearn for the days of trade. This is why capitalism will fall. Story 3. This wasn't a weird one, but a genius one for a tween. A girl set up a little business out of a box of stationery, writing forged letters from parents. She had all different paper, pens and pencils of every kind, and could write in convincingly accurate tone for the content of the notes, depending on which kid they were for. She used different styles of handwriting and different styles of punctuation and language, too. She would even fudge up the spelling if she thought the kid's parents weren't great at it. She grew up to be incredibly educated. I look back and see that as her first moment of evil genius. It definitely suggested she would go on to brilliance one day, and she did. Story 4. Our middle school tried to start a reward program. It turned out to be a fail of epic proportion. Wolf Bucks, named after our mascot. They were mini-sized dollars color-coded by value. Green was $1, red was 5 blue was 10 and a gold wolf buck, only accessible to the principal and assistant principal, $50. Now, the school bought erasers, pencils, notebooks, you could only buy with wolf bucks. One pencil, one wolf buck. First failure, it was easy to copy, so kids started mass copying them. Okay, school got smart and said, only accepting wolf bucks with your name and your teacher's signature. Second failure, kept the same color. So kids would earn one legitimately, then the forgery started. Third failure, hyperinflation. During pep rallies, the principal started throwing golden wolf bucks. Eventually, the school stopped resupplying the store. Everyone had hundreds slash thousands of worthless wolf bucks. Story 5. I still don't get it, but back in primary school, they were collecting bottle caps for some kind of charity. Google it, it's still ongoing around the world. So what happened was everything was going well. The teacher got everyone excited about it, and kids were collecting en masse. Kids would go around raiding for it, from the trash, from their school lunches, from their homes even. A teacher got a call from a concerned parent because her kid hijacked all of the bottle caps from their kitchen. So that's stage one of the weirdness. It's what happened afterwards, stage two. Kids started trading with these plastic bottle caps. We would trade pens, homework, and even Pokemon cards for bottle caps. Worthless bottle caps. 
There wasn't even a prize for whoever could collect the most, it just became a currency out of nowhere. Let's talk about stage 3, theft. There was no bank of bottle caps at our school. There was the donation box, and there were your cubbies. Those who didn't want to lug their stash back home every day left it in their cubbies, and some kid decided to steal people's caps and from the donation box. The great theft of class 3B. But it was probably for the best because overnight the madness subsided. The teacher ended the bottle cap donation. She was sick of the bugs that were gathering and licking up the dried up sugar juices from the caps anyway, but mostly horrified at how her little charity drive devolved into a socio-economical experiment. Just like that, the bottle cap market crashed. Just more fuel for the fire of the kids yearn for trade, I'm telling you. They had no incentive to trade these bottle caps for anything like Pokemon cards. But they did. Pokemon cards have more of a tangible value than a bottle cap, but kids don't care about tangible value. They care about what's important to them, and what's important to them was bottle caps. Money is fake, remember that. Story 6. I organized the black market. My school banned Pokemon cards, so I made a new game with paper cards. I was drawing pretty well, so I folded a paper in 9, and it made pieces approximately the size of a Pokemon card and created a whole new game out of this. Sold boosters for 10 cents. Spent all my afternoons drawing cards for the school. Teachers eventually heard of it and couldn't ban it because it was still officially me distributing drawings. And then I started to do replicas of Pokemon cards. Like, people had to come and show me the proof after school that they owned the original card. I made a replica, and then the whole Pokemon card trading continued with paper replicas. Then after school, people made the real exchanges based on what replicas they exchanged during school. Now this is truly genius. I also tried making my own card game when I was super young because I loved those cards. But I was not a good artist at all, didn't go far. Sounds like OP here found a nice little niche and filled it. Story 7. Sharpened Sticks When we learned about cavemen, we decided it would be a great idea to create our own prehistoric clan. So we smashed rocks and used them to sharpen tree branches. Some of us were particularly keen on sharpening, and started to use walls as grindstones. They were able to sharpen about six sticks in half an hour, and started exchanging them for berries during recess. Story 8. I think I was 16 when this happened, but basically a bunch of guys began printing paper that looked like contracts, with the top saying, Soul Contract. They would come up to some of the younger students and get them to sign the document to sell their soul for eternity, and would pay them two to three dollars, converting to USD. We had a good laugh when some of the students became worried they had actually sold their souls. Just goes to show that if the devil really wanted to, he could just like show up and, I don't know, kindergartens, maybe a little higher elementary schools, and be like, hey kid, wanna sell your soul? And then they'd be like, yeah, absolutely, could I have five dollars? And he'd be like, yeah, and then that's that. Story 9. Drawings. It started out as a joke. Some kids made beautiful drawings and traded them for others. At one point, we decided to give them a value. If a drawing was really pretty, let's say 8 out of 10, we would number it with 8, and you could trade it for two fours. There were kids that would not draw but were chosen to ride these drawings. At one point, kids would trade snacks for beautiful drawings. This started in my class, and in a couple of days, the whole school was doing it. My drawings were okay, but not great. And sadly, I never got snacks to bring to school, so I had nothing to trade. So I decided to recruit other kids that were really good and would be their manager so they had more time to draw. I had siblings in other grades, so I would contact them to trade in their class so there was more ground to collect snacks from. I also bargained with the kids that would rate the drawings, promising them a share of the snacks. My clients would share their snacks with me as payment for my services. I still remember those stupid horse flower drawings. Horse girls went nuts over these and would give anything for them. Oh, and in high school, I was the only kid in my year that knew how to download music to your phone. I would make a list of songs people wanted and would transfer these through Bluetooth. I would charge one cookie for each song. So that first one I thought was going to go a lot worse because when people start putting like numbers on art, kids uh, in particular, but adults actually too, get angry about it. Sounds like everything worked out here though, so that's good. Also, the writing in it was strange. I think I said ride these drawings at some point, and I swear that's what the post says. Pretty sure that was supposed to be rate. Also, the funniest spelling of bargained I have ever seen. B-A-R-G-E-N-T. Now, not to rag on OP, they could be English as a second language, I just thought it was funny, and word wrong is the most eternal form of comedy in my opinion. Now, for the second part though, I kind of did something like this. When I was younger, I had a DS. And with that DS, I was gifted a, uh, one of those custom games where you can put an SD card in. So basically I could download games off the internet illegally and play them. What this also let me do is modify the games on my computer. And being relatively tech savvy, I did. In particular, Pokemon. Pokemon Diamond and Pearl had absolutely no mercy from me. 
I would cheat in shinies, legendaries, lol level 100 with whatever moves people wanted. And I would trade them to kids at my summer camp in exchange for, I think, actual money. Which, now that I think about it, sounds pretty suspicious. I probably shouldn't have been doing that. It was like hacking them in. But hey, I was providing a service and they were happy to pay. Hope you enjoyed your shiny Jirachi, Jared. Story 10. In year 10, I was able to gain access to a teacher's account on my school tablet, which allowed me to get internet access. I then realized I could open a hotspot which allowed other students to have internet access on their tablets. We weren't allowed to have cell phones. I decided to charge $10 a week for each student that wanted to subscribe for internet access which I was distributing. I started receiving requests from students not in the radius of the hotspot. Thus, I figured out a way for users to SSH connect to my school tablet and use it to gain internet access. It was a mess and the network became too slow, but I was still getting paid regardless. Best of all, the IT guy knew what I was doing, but he wasn't able to stop it, since the school only employed one guy to handle everything. Thus, he was too busy to do anything about it. Story 11. Not really black market, but uh, kinda. It was in the 90s, and most people had a computer, but internet was still very slow when you had it. I was a teen and had managed to put my hand on a CD-ROM with three adult videos on it. The kind of CD-ROM that was offered with the magazine you could find on the highest shelf of the newspaper stand. I was starting to know all three videos by heart, so I decided to lend it to a friend. And then I kinda forgot about it. A few days later I noticed during the class that another unrelated person was lending my video to yet another guy. My CD-ROM was having a life of its own, moving from hand to hand, providing happiness along the way. I was very proud. Story 12. Well, it was glue to get high on, but there's a weird story behind it. The school district gives out a mandatory anonymous quiz-like thing every year. Basically, it asks how safe you feel on campus, how close you are with teachers, do you need any help with schoolwork, the standard stuff to say they care when really they're only using it to slip in a question or two that they really want to know the answer of, but it's under the guise that they want to know about everything. Anyway, one of the sections that they just added that year was about drugs. There had been reports to them of a drug problem in our school and in two others. So they asked the typical, have you ever felt peer pressured into drinking beer, wine, or any alcohol type thing? And one of the questions was, have you ever felt the desire to inhale glue in order to feel high? Or something to that effect. Everyone was so surprised at that question, and immediately after the test was over, we had our lunch break. So what do you know, everyone's trying to get their hands on the school's glue supply to see if it actually worked. And by the time our next period started, I think it's safe to say a third of our school was high. So yeah, now there's a glue black market at that school. You can just about always find them in front of the school office too, which I think is just asking for trouble, but hey, nothing bad has happened to the kids who are doing it, so. Story 13. Pogs. Back in the 90s. Sure, you could easily trade your standard commercial pogs out in the open. We would do it before and after class, teachers and administrators didn't care. Oh look, it's got Simba on it, cute, I recall one saying. But there was a darker, more twisted trading game afoot, lurking in the boys' bathroom, mid-class. The kind that, if found, would easily get you detention or even possibly suspension. Doom Pogs. Doom Pogs were awful and awesome all at once. Circular cutouts from old adult magazines, gory grossness from Fangoria, creatively illustrated preteen brilliance like Bang Master and Miss Alfred's Kitty, written in marker over a picture of a cat, were just some of the devilishly deviant 7th grade wares you could find during emergency bathroom trips during 3rd and 5th period. It was quite a sight, and then just as quickly as it began, it all came crashing down. Not because of a slip-up by any one student, no. What killed the Doompog trade in our school was a sudden bursting in of the vice principal, who had to poop really badly but couldn't hold it till he got to the teacher's bathroom in the office. And there we were, caught red-handed. I really wish I could say it was Madonna's breast glued over top a yin-yang symbol that did us in that day, but the truth is, it was our own hubris and greed. And with that, the great Doom Pog trade died. Or so they thought. Story 14. I wouldn't say it was weird, but my friend in high school had a prepper granddad waiting for Y2K. He literally had crates filled with cartons of off-brand cigarettes. So my friend would steal a few cartons, bring them to me, and I would sell them out of my locker. I would charge $3 a pack. He would get a buck and I would get the other two. Or 50 cents for loose cigarettes and we would just split that down the middle. I only kept like six packs in a pencil case. Five whole and one open for the loose ones to sell. He would have the rest in his locker at the other end of the school and I would just go refill as needed between classes or at lunch. One time a teacher called the cops because I was acting suspicious. 
They pulled me out of class and brought in a drug dog to search my locker. I had just sold my last Lucy and pack like 10 minutes before that. The dog didn't find anything, but the cops went through everything anyway. When he opened the pencil box, there were little shreds of tobacco inside. He asked, What's this? And I said, Well, it's a pencil box. I would guess, probably pencil shavings. And he just shrugged and put it back. Went right back to selling cigarettes the next day. Oh, I would also trade one Lucy for a meal ticket. That's how our lunch system worked. And would also sell the meal tickets for $1 each and split that with my buddy too. Ah, uh, OP, if it were anything but cigarettes, I would be proud of you. I just can't be that thrilled of the idea of high schoolers ruining their lungs. I know it's been happening all throughout time since cigarettes were invented, but still. Addiction starts young, kids. Story 15. Scissors. One day at school, I just stole some scissors to joke with my friends. Eventually, it turned into a thing, and me and my friends would do it at break for fun. But after a while, I had so many, I decided to sell them as any 10-year-old would. After that, it all kind of faded out for a while. Then, one day, these four kids came up to me with a whole school bag of scissors. I brought the bag and then started to sell the scissors again. Eventually, like a week later, I literally had a whole enterprise of scissors, and I would sell and buy scissors to the rival scissors club at the other school and earn like $20 a day, even after paying my whole team. But after a solid three months, the teachers sat us all down, the whole primary school, and made all the scissors be returned. What do you mean, rival scissors club? I'm assuming just another group of kids doing the same thing at a different school. But it's still a weird concept, just a scissors club. Story 16. Hell man, you name it. Japanese adult content, weed, mixtapes, n-word passes, hard lemonade. There was pretty much nothing you couldn't buy if you could find the right buyer. There was essentially a smuggling empire in my high school. Me? I was more of a peddler of basic goods rather than the usual fence for contraband. My role gave me a degree of respect, I guess. I flew under the radar of the security officers because what's so suspicious about a guy with the general school material? Instead of the more exotic stuff from other people, I sold books, pens, pencils, erasers, answer keys, stuff that goes unnoticed. The gig actually got me quite a lot of money because hey, it's still school and we need to learn. But no one said that you couldn't make the process easier. Story 17. When my daughter was nine, I got a call from her school for an emergency parent-teacher meeting. I went to the school with my wife and met my ex-wife at the school because this was apparently a big deal. The teacher and principal presented us with the information that my daughter had been the ringleader with a number of other girls in organizing a fight club between the boys and her grade. My daughter had meticulously drawn out standings charts, kept the win-loss records from each recess period, and kept bios including quotes on each participant. She kept track to make sure that boys of similar fighting ability weren't paired with others who couldn't keep up. The winners at the end of each day got a kiss from the girl of his choice. She also kept track of who got the most kisses, which none of the others had thought of apparently, in order to keep something on the popular girls. She also offered betting odds and ran that on the side, betting in money and candy. This had been going on for almost a month. I was impressed. Astonished that she had done all this work and had been so meticulous about it. The school employees and the ex were somewhat less impressed. We settled on three weeks of in-school suspension and she got moved into a more advanced math class. This was 13 years ago. She's just finishing her honors BA this year and is looking at her master's in the fall. I still reference the Fight Club occasionally and am still proud. I gotta say, I, I respect the hell out of this girl. I get that it's probably not a great thing, but it's like, what was it, middle school? Hold on, I'm looking. Yeah, she was nine. It's like elementary school. These boys weren't seriously hurting each other. And if there's a bunch of people around watching, I'm sure someone would step. No, I shouldn't say that. Kids are kind of ruthless. But there was no mention of like kids getting seriously hurt being the way they found out, so maybe it wasn't that bad. The whole kisses at the end thing, that's, that's a little strange. But hey, it's a uh, entrepreneurial spirit, I suppose. And a bit of like a cartel leader thrown in there too. Story 18. The dude who sold our fake IDs was really committed to his work. He made state and college licenses, carried around two metal rings with samples of all the stuff he could make, using Britney Spears from the Hit Me Baby One More Time album as the photo. He would also give you the ID in a white envelope. I had a rush order once and he had a standard rate for that, ended up picking it up from him at home on the other side of the city. Dude was on point. I think he ended up being an interior decorator. Story 19. Neon color gel pens. So back in 98-ish, my school got these Bic neon gel pens and black paper. Index cards, sticky notes, and notebooks. Well, for maybe not so obvious at the time reasons, teachers hated this. So immediately there was a ban on all neon pens and black paper. And what happens when you ban something? Well, it started with just a few kids that had the cool parents who would still buy them these. By a month's time, these kids turned into dealers. Soon it started looking like the crack epidemic. Kids were going around robbing each other. The addicts were checking trash cans for empties. 
gang colors, whether you were like hot pink, lime green, blaze orange, etc. Seen some real heavy stuff that semester. But like, what would the kids do with these neon Bic pens? Because you couldn't do any assignments and it would just for fun? If it's just for fun, why did the people hate it? People being the teachers and stuff. I feel like I'm missing something here, but it's true. Anytime anything is banned in school, it immediately becomes a hot commodity, so fair enough. Anyway, thank you so much for watching. I hope you had some fun along the way. I hope you have a wonderful day or a night wherever you are, and I'll see you in the next one.